<laughs> Why Shapiro? Why not Shapiro? Uh, Everyone's saying, is yeah. this really Shapiro? But this time, what I get is like, well, you're, are you trying to hide the fact you're Jewish? And I'm always like, oh, if, really? <laughs> but I do get that. I'm like, if I was trying to hide the fact I'm Jewish, wouldn't I change my name to like Smith or like White? Or like, I mean, I wouldn't change it to Shapiro. I wouldn't change the way I pronounce it. <laughs> Mark, thanks for doing this, man. Yeah. Welcome to Every to Conversation here. Counts. Yeah, I'm happy to be with you. Well, nice office and backdrop you have here. This is not too bad, yeah. You're, anytime you walk into a ballpark every day as your office, you got to feel fortunate, you know, and I've, I've been doing that. This is my 25th year doing that, albeit at a different ballpark, but there's not a day I don't feel uh, like I'm a lucky guy. Well, you know, the interesting thing about this being your office and you say 25 years is you make a, a powerful choice in the last year to say yeah. 24 years with the Cleveland Indians, Let's switch it up. Yeah. What moment or what trigger hits you to say, you know what, it's time to do something different because you pretty much had it set in Cleveland. I did. You know, it was uh, love the people I was with. I think it really got down to this, that if you are a really effective leader um, and you really care deeply and invest in your people and you develop your people, uh, at some point you create an or organization that doesn't need you, an organization that kind of uh, has you know you in a capacity where you're more of kind of an advisor and a resource than you are actively managing the company and I think it got to a point where like I'm ready for the next challenge I need to throw myself into something new um, and at the same time as kind of thinking those things I might be ready for it Toronto comes calling and says and I and you look up and go wow you know one of the most incredible cities uh, in the world uh, the only team in all of Major League Baseball that represents a country you know, not, not a city. This is something I need to at least engage and listen. And the more I listened, uh, the more it felt like, hey, if I'm ever gonna leave, uh, this would be one of those jobs to leave for. It is amazing to see the position you're in now because if we look back at your story, you were a student that studied history yeah. and played football. That's right. How do you go from those modest beginnings to being the president and CEO of not one, but two Major League Baseball franchises? That we don't have enough time for that. Full, for talk, walking, <laughs> you, notes. walking you through the full progressions, but I, I think, you know, you you make that progression by two things. One, people that see something in you believe in you and empower you, uh, and then two, uh, an approach, an attitude, a mindset uh, that I am determined that I will persevere. Uh, that setbacks are not something that are going to take me off course, but they're going to be something that's an opportunity to develop, to improve, and to grow. Uh, and that every time I do encounter some challenge and some adversity, I'm going to get better. I'm going to use those you know, circumstances as, as the foundation for, for getting better. And so uh, I think you know, those two things, really the opportunities that have been provided to me um, and then the understanding that uh, when I get those opportunities, it's not all going to be roses, you know, that I'm going to have to work my tail off. I'm not that smart. Uh, I'm not that gifted. You know, I'm going to have to work, and then I'm going to have to persevere as well. You mentioned the idea of somebody believing in you. Yeah. When you start as a front office assistant, for example, with the Cleveland Indians, who was it that saw the potential, and what did they say that really stuck with you that gave you that belief? Yeah, that, so that, that is a great question. Um, I think it was really two guys. It was John Hart, you know, who's running the Atlanta, fran Atlanta baseball franchise now, and Dan O'Dowd, who was a longtime GM at Colorado after Cleveland, and now is a, an analyst for MLB Network. Um, you know, and I can vividly remember, you know, talking to both those guys. Um, Dan, you know, really was just the amount of responsibility he gave me and the understanding of developing a, a core uh, skill set that would be the foundation of my career. John, it was absolutely belief in me and empowerment. Um, you know, really the impact of what empowerment can do for a young person when they come in, the impact that uh, that sincere, deep and authentic level of belief can mean, I mean, I can remember taking a new idea to John. Hey, I want to have, create individual development plans for every single player in our minor league system because that was what they, they gave me to run, the farm system. And that hadn't been done. And John, I'm, I'm managing men that are twice my age, that have been in the game for 20, 25 years, that have played professionally, and I'm gonna bring this new concept up to them. And I'm sure they're all gonna come running to you. This kid's crazy. Uh, and John just looked at me and said, hey, you're a guy. You're a guy. I mean, I got your back. Go, do it. You know, you're, you know it was this absolute just 
simple belief in me that, you know, I was a guy, you know, and that he believed in me. This guy was, you know, going to be executive of the year in a short period of time and who had done everything there was to do in the game. And, you know, the, I've never forgotten the power that that has. Uh, and I've tried to pay both, you know, Don, Dan and John's belief in me forward uh, to both the importance of, uh, to place the importance in hiring talented people, but not just hiring them, but empowering them very quickly. You know, I've never viewed hiring an intern that your job is to get lunch or do a menial task. Your job is to make us better. The day you get here, walk in the door and make us better. And I think that's the way I was treated. Uh, I've benefited from that and I've tried to always, you know, uh, employ that wherever I work and in whatever I, area I work in. If you looked at what the deal breaker, what the separator was with the questions you ask when you're deciding, is this the right person? Great question. What, what is that question? If I had to ask one question, uh, it would be simply, you know, how someone, the, the, the perspective, uh, the mindset that they take into viewing setbacks, challenges, and adversity. You know, when I think about people uh, and whether we're hiring uh, players or whether we're hiring executives, uh, I think if you want an indicator of their ability to persevere and be successful, um, it's going to be how they handle adversity. You know, it's going to give you the greatest window and the greatest insight uh, into what type of performer they are. Um, so I think that uh, I want people that view those as, as growth opportunities. I don't want people to view those as weaknesses and flaws and being exposed. I think that's, you know, that's not the mindset that championship organizations are built upon. But when it comes down to your role, tough decisions need to be made. Absolutely. And for any leader, sometimes you're walking into a conversation where you know you are going to need to manage ego and attitude. How do you prepare your mindset to do that so, again, you achieve a positive outcome? May not necessarily be a negotiation, but you need to get someone on board with the vision. How do you do that? Well, I think, you know, listen, you, it's hard to do those things in one conversation. I think that it comes from two things. One, you want to engender respect and trust. Um, how do you engender respect and trust? I think that's how you live your life. You know, it's not going to be one conversation. Um, I've always viewed leadership this way. If you think that you're going to walk in a building and put your president and CEO cape on and be that guy for a day, if you think you're going to walk, you know, into a clubhouse and, you know, you're going to be able to be a different person, a different, a different leader in that setting, then you are a different father, husband, brother, friend, son, then you're mistaken. You know, that's not authentic and you have very little chance of that conversation resonating, very little chance of that conversation having a lasting or meaningful impact. If you want a tough conversation to be one that uh, has an impact and has a, an opportunity to actually, you know, be effective for you, then you need to do the work to clarify what your values are and make sure there's a consistency between the man you are and the leader you are. There can't be separation. You know, the man you are has to be the leader you are. And so I think uh, what I've seen are the people who have a sense of peace about them, um, have done the work to kind of understand who they are as a human being and a person, they have a compass to go to. Whether it's a tough conversation, whether it's the celebration, you know, they can, they're the same person. They separate, they don't define themselves by someone else's, you know, depiction of who they are. They don't define themselves by superficial, you know, accomplishments or criticism. You know, they're pretty sure about who they are, and they're able to go in and out of both good conversations and tough conversations with equal impact and with equal meaning. Playing on that sentiment, I look at you and what you represent uh, with the mantra of treating everybody equally. Yes. And what you have learned about leadership and perhaps what's evolved or what's changed, what is one thing about leadership that you once believed that is no longer true? Wow, that's, uh, I, I think, look, when you, when you first uh, enter into leadership positions, um, you've got some perceived conception you know, that you have to act like a leader, you know, that people are going to be watching you, that you've got uh, to handle yourself in a way that demonstrates authority, you know, that uh, people will respect, you know, someone who's powerful. Um, and I think over time what you, you quickly come to understand is that it's more empathy and compassion, um, that it's more a deep understanding of the people that you're leading and uh, a deep level of caring about them and investing in them and taking an interest in their development, in their growth and in their lives that's going to truly create you know, a special organization, a special place to work and ultimately create special efforts 
you know, really what you're trying to do when you lead an organization is say, um, how can I help people recognize how meaningful, you know, their work is? How do I help people understand that for us to do exceptional things, which is what we're trying to do right out here, win a world championship, that's exceptional, particularly with the Red Sox and Yankees in our division. For us to do that, it's going to take exceptional efforts from an entire organization, not just players, an entire organization, top to bottom, from ticket takers to scouts to player developments to trainers to people that work in marketing and community, right? It's going to take everybody. Um, and to do that, you know, I think you need to, to really act with that level of empathy and compassion. You need to understand that everybody is important and that, you know, because you have a title, um, because you're superficially looked at at some level, you're not any better than anybody else. And so I think you're, you know, you hit on that kind of in, in introing the question, treating people equally. Uh, that's something my dad modeled for me in the way he's lived his life, that you don't quantify people, you don't qualify people, you know, you're, you're looking at every person of being valuable, valuable and valued. And if you lead that way, uh, you've got a greater chance, I think, to have better outcomes. Well, you mentioned your father. Ron Shapiro is a very successful sports agent back in the day, and you talk about conversations, leadership, negotiation is a big part of it, and given your role now, there are some tough conversations you need to have. When you approach any given negotiation, what, what is your strategy? What do you keep in mind as the key to success to reach a positive outcome? Yeah, so if my dad ever watches this, I, I, will be, I have to be very careful in how I, refl Ron, how I respond. Ron, this to you. Yeah. So, you know, my, I think the one thing that, I, that my dad talks about repeatedly that I, I do really employ uh, or deploy when we negotiate, whether it's me or anybody else in the organization, and that is a successful negotiation is much more tied to the level of preparation you put into it um, and, and the level of insight you have as to who you're negotiating with. So if I'm negotiating with you, I need to take the time to learn what your interests are. Um, the better I learn your interests, uh, and your alternatives as well as understand my own alternatives and really prepare meticulously uh, and carefully with a lot of rigor, the better chance we have to find an outcome that, and I think in the end, this is an industry where you want the, the outcome to be positive for both sides. I want to win a negotiation, but I don't want the person to feel like I beat them down and that they lost. I just want it to be a win-win. I just want to win a little more. And so I think that to do that, you really need to understand who you're negotiating with and you need to have a rigor to your preparation. Well, I'm thinking with that, if you take me for bingo and beef nachos, <laughs> you're, you're in the driver's seat. But that's good to know. <laughs> I'll record that. It's the simple things. It's the simple yeah. things. These are powerful words to hear, and to have this type of confidence uh, is inspiring. Along the way, as you develop this, what experience or uh, what lesson did you learn that allows you to cultivate this 100% belief in yourself? <laughs> well. It's not 100%, right? I mean, every one of us has moments of doubt. I think that, you know, who you are and who you surround yourself with has a big way of managing your doubt. And I, I think that's actually one of the most crucial things is that, you know, when I observe, right, you know, uh, human behavior, you know, and when you think about what derails people, you know, what derails women or men, when you, when you disconnect, when you say, ooh, that was, what, what were they thinking when they said that? It's usually insecurities, you know, that's my belief. And uh, so I think there is, you know, to be successful, you've got to manage your own insecurities. You've got to have self-awareness. Um, as far as what leads to that, you know, ability to be confident that even when I stumble, I can still, you know, persevere. Um, I do think it's the mentors, you know, that I've had in my life. So we, we talked about my father, we talked about John Hart. You know, there was a high school football coach who made a meaningful impact on me by kind of telling me and, under, you know, and, and kind of educating me to, you know, the importance of consistency, of dependability, of reliability, of showing up every day with your best effort, uh, of understanding that there are box checkers in life, people who just perform tasks, and there are people who have high standards and expectations. And, you know, I'm the sum of not one person. I'm the sum of not one philosophy or one experience. It's more of, you know, waking up every day with a sense of humility uh, and a sense of wanting to get better and knowing that there's stimulus out there every day to help me get better. A conversation with you, an article I might read, an interaction with someone in the office, um, that there's opportunities to get better. If you're focused on getting better every day, 
uh, there are opportunities to get better. And, and you got to be humble and open, you know, to that stimuli every day. You know, focusing on that aspect of getting better and growth uh, showcases a great deal of vulnerability. I guess I kind of put you on the spot with this question. You know, you mentioned your role is to manage insecurities. What would you say as a leader, 25 years in the major leagues, <laughs> is your greatest insecurity? Um, I mean, listen, we all live with fear, worry, and doubt. You know, my greatest insecurity is probably that I might not be successful. You know, that doubt, um, that, uh, you know, people might not understand, you know, where my talents lie, what I'm capable of doing, and that, uh, um, you know, that's fr there, that could be frustrating to me. Um, you know, that would probably be something I need to manage uh, along with a little bit of impatience. If you talk to people that are close to me, they would tell you that my, that, you know, the area I need to manage is my patience a little bit because I like a sense of urgency uh, in an organization and in me. Uh, there's a line between urgency and patience, though, and I think you, you still got to be patient, even if you, even if you are driving hard with a sense of urgency. But um, you know, my 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 insecurities just you know lie in the potential that it might not work out. You know, but I think what's most important is the reaction. If it doesn't work out, is more important than, than the worry. You know, that it might not. In three months with the Blue Jays, what would you say is the most important conversation you've had here with this organization, or maybe even with the people here in Canada? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, we'd probably go back to one of those conversations with Paul Beeston that just kind of really where it was that moment that I already knew it was special to work for a team that, uh, you know, represents a country. Uh, but to hear Paul really articulate what it means to be Canada's team uh, and to feel that sense of pride and passion uh, and understand that, that that's what you're working for here. Really, that's what you're working for. And that's the responsibility, you know, that comes with this job. Uh, I would probably say that was probably one of the more important conversations that I've had. You know, that is great to hear because you know the legacy is going to live on. And when we speak about legacy in the Shapiro household, uh, your father, Ron, I mean, such a great influence for you. What would you say is the most impactful conversation you ever had with your father? <laughs> um, you know, I... I, I struggle with one conversation with him because the way he's lived his life um, has had such has had more of an impact than anybody else there's bar none um, there are momentary conversations along the way not the bigger ones you might think but I, I vividly remember uh, my dad was uh, probably more consumed with me understanding the an, an appreciation for the way I was growing up uh, for me having values that demonstrated, you know, an understanding of that, uh, not taking things for granted, of understanding how hard work and treating people fits into being successful in life. Uh, and so because of that, I, I had a little uh, disproportionate uh, level of responsibilities and, and chores around the house. And I remember one time, probably, you know, 12, 13 years old, probably the same age as my son, uh, I was weeding, you know, a bed, you know, a flower bed, you know, out behind the house one weekend probably cursing him as I was doing it because none of my friends were doing that. They were all out playing. And uh, I remember getting done, right? I finished, Dad, I'm done. And him walking over and saying, yeah, you you finished, but you did a bad job. And uh, I remember him just sitting down, not yelling, just talking to me about, you know, hey, if you're going to do something, you know, do a good job or don't do it at all. Because, you know, this is a reflection of you, you know, that uh, the work you do, you know, is a reflection of who you are as a person. And if you want to take pride in that, you know, regardless of the menial task or the big task, you don't qualify those. And you want to make sure that every one of those things is a reflection of, you know, who you are as a person, your character, you know, your resilience, your perseverance, you know, the things you stand for. And, uh, you know, it's a simple conversation about a household chore that has stuck with me for a lifetime. Is your dad available for this interview series? Because he seems like he'd be pretty good. <laughs> He'll be in town. You know, I'm sure you can catch him this season. We got a book, Ron Shapiro. Yeah, he's a great one. Well, you know, it's an interesting ride. And I guess, uh, you know, as we, we kind of get a wrap up point on this, when you approach the key to building relationships and just that simple notion of the people you encounter making every conversation count. Yes. How do you do it? Well, I think that, you know, the, the title speaks for itself. I think, you know, um, an awareness walking into a situation, you know, of both myself um, you know, this is a little bit reiterating the things we've talked about over the past half hour, but, 
you know, an awareness of myself, you know, my strengths, you know, my maybe preconceptions coming into a situation, but more importantly, kind of a deep sense of awareness of who I'm talking to. What are their interests? What are their goals? What are their aspirations? What's their culture and background? Where do they come from? You know, what are they looking to get out of a, a situation, short term or long term? How can I help? Because I think my goal ultimately is to help them reach their goals. I've got some self-interest involved. I want to do some great things out here. Uh, but I think to make the conversation count, you know, for me, the person's got to start with the person knowing that I genuinely care and want to help them. We'll keep fighting the good fight. Yeah. Mark Shapiro. Yes. Thanks All for right, doing man. this, brother. Thanks, man. Good Appreciate it, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Appreciate it. Hey, it's Riaz. Thanks for watching. For more conversations, click on subscribe and check us out online at everyconversationcounts.com.